Jones Tatton side of the uh, auditorium this morning. There's another wedding going on today, so we've had several that have split uh, to head to that wedding. So, but thank you for your support. It was a blessed day, and it will take us probably a month to recover. Um, but we appreciate that. But um, Paul's with uh, a ministry he calls Psalms 121 Ministry. He's going to come and share about that ministry. Um, as I said, he's been involved in our life for a very long time, and I'm going to keep the stories to a minimum because he has the mic after me. But I will say this, he baptized two of my kids, and mysteriously, the hot water, the heater, broke just in time for their baptismal. So they got <laughs> baptized in freezing cold water. I think he did it on purpose, but you know. <laughs> Anyways, preacher, come and share with us, and then when we're done, there is a box in the back for you to help support the ministry that he's a part of. Paul? Thank you very much. <laughs> I probably, if I did anything about the water, was hoping you were in there. <laughs> All right. Well, it is a joy to be here today, and uh, I just want to say this. This country up here is so, so beautiful. Uh, we live down in North Carolina, and it's farming country where we're at. But I, we came up through Ohio, the Ohio Valley, then come up and we went over to, what was the, Holland, Michigan. And how all the way up so beautiful. I said, well, it can't get much better than that. But when I took that little cutoff to come over here to church, and I said, man, it's better. I said, I wouldn't mind living right there or there or right there. <laughs> and then when we went for the, uh, the meal after the rehearsal, the house we went to, I don't know if they're here today, but that was an awesome place down on the river. I said, ooh, I wouldn't mind living right there. <laughs> I think it's like, uh, you know, John Denver sang a song, Almost Heaven, West Virginia. He had never been up here before. <laughs> That's what I look at in him. But it is a joy to be here, and I'm going to briefly, if I could do that, if I can figure out what I'm supposed to do, uh, give you an uh, overview of what Psalm 121 Ministries is. If you could bring that up, it would be great. And by the way, while that's happening, I have uh, some things on the table outside that you can pick up. Uh, it either has a card attached or not on the table. But it just tells you a little bit about the ministry. These are the things that's happened over the last two years. And uh, I'm not going to go over that. You can read that when you get home. But there's that and it's just a few tracks laying on the table to pick it up. And it's, is God real? And of course, I think most of you already know that he is real. But uh, we had a great time yesterday, and today, uh, as we talk about this, and I will say this before, again, I'm technologically challenged. I was told what to do, and I've already got it pointed the wrong way, so I better turn it around this way. And he said, push the button that has not got the arrow on it. So if I mess up, it's me. But anyhow, our ministry is called Psalm 21 Ministries, and uh, Psalm 121 begins with, I lift up mine eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. I'm going to tell you, my whole life's been looking to that. Because I know I'm not the, the uh, one that does the work that does the miraculous things that God does, but he does use me. And I will tell you this, if he can use a redneck from North Carolina, he can use you. So just, just know that. And I've got to remember to do that. And uh, I just said that. Oh, down low. There you go. Uh, the, the main thrust of the ministry is to exalt the name of Christ. Of course, that's what any ministry, any person that's a believer should do. And uh, the next part is we want to edify the church. We want to build the church up. Uh, why am I here today? To build the church up. That's why you, you come to church as believers, as a pastor, as a son. You're here to help each other grow in Christ. And also to evangelize the lost. You're all, we're always in the process of telling people about Jesus. And I'll tell you, that is something I really love to do. Um, I won my first person to Christ when I was 16 years old in a, son, uh, a Bible school at, at my church I was growing up in. His name was Bobby James. I never will forget that. Bobby James trusted Christ right in the middle of a Genesis one, telling about creation. I said, Bobby, uh, 
do you know what it means to know Jesus? He said, no, but I would like to. So we sat down and talked. He trusted Christ. And I kind of got a taste of something I liked a whole lot. And since then, there's been many, many people come to Christ through that, but to evangelize the lost and then to equip the believers to get out and be good disciples of Christ. I got it. All right. Um, we disciple believers uh, through some of Bible camps, and there'll be a picture or two of that in a moment. Actually, the, the camp that Roger started at in Virginia is uh, the pictures are at the camp. The camp's been in, in um, work, working condition, almost, sort of, for about 70 years. And so it's, it's, it's a great camp, and a lot of kids have come to Christ, church planning, and uh, just interactive ministry. Uh, what you see here is Springs of Life uh, Camp Retreats. Uh, uh, Bible Day Camp is the, the week we usually ministered in. Kids would come in from all the community up in uh, Patrick Springs and we'd bring other churches in there. And every week, it's, every time we had camp, we'd see many kids come to Christ. These are just scenes. Uh, and probably, if you look hard, you might see some of the kids that are Rogers in there somewhere, but I'm not positive. Uh, back up there. Now, that pool up there, that's a major thing at any camp. I want to tell you this, pray for the camp right now. The health department has come in and told them that pool cannot be opened again until it's completely redone. There's water coming in from underground up in the pool, and that's going to be a major thing to get under that, and it's going to cost them uh, something like a half a million dollars to fix that thing. And you know what? A Christian camp doesn't have a half a million dollars laying around. It's just not something that happens, but uh, that pool is an integral part of the camp. Uh, the kids, they play in that water. They uh, just enjoy that so much that we have campfires at night, uh, uh, preaching in the, uh, the chapel and all. That's been redone, so that's a good thing. But anyhow, that's part of the ministry is the camping ministry. And another part is church planting. Uh, this is a, a for the first church that we planted in Zambia, Africa. It's the name Shady Grove Baptist Church. I was pastor at Shady Grove Baptist Church where Roger and the family used to go. And uh, that's the name that the African pastor picked out for the church. And it kind of pleased me, you know, to ask the pastor in America. But he said, we're at Shady Grove number two. And that's him right there beside in that picture. His name's Michael Skoyanga. He's become a great friend. And he is the on-the-ground person that runs things in Zambia when I'm not there. And even when I'm there, I just depend on him so, so much. He takes care of everything. Okay. These are uh, the, the flowery shirts. This is uh, the church choir at Shady Grove. And I wish I had a musical thing to give you there, but I don't. But um, if you're sitting inside the church, that bottom right-hand corner, that's what it looks like. The air conditioner is working. See the cracks in the wall? It blows right through just like that. And if you're standing on the platform, there's a, a big uh, piece of material up here. And if the wind's blowing from that way, it's coming back here and bumping you on the head while you're up there preaching. But it's a wonderful thing. There's about, uh, hmm, I think about 250 members of that church now. But they, they're not just a come to church people. Since they were formed, there are now three other churches that that pastor pastors off of that church. So you, you, you think about that. It's an open door of ministry, and I'll explain some, some more of that to you. Let me back up one more. Um, I think that, no, it's gone. Sorry, yeah, yeah, it's right at the top corner. You see those little steps going down like that? That's a baptistry. Um, when Shady Grove was formed, it's a, uh, it's a Zambian area thing with uh, government. You have to have something built before you can actually start meeting there. So they dug a hole, and they cemented the walls, and they filled it up with water. It's, not, it's empty right there. So because it had water in it, you could meet there. And the first meeting that they had there, I happened to be able to be there. They built that pit. Uh, the, one of the times when I came back, they had that pit ready. And as I was on my way out there, 
the people were rolling barrels up the hill towards where the church place was. And uh, I said, where are they going? What are they doing? Oh, that's some of our ladies. They're going to fill up the baptistry. Well, they had 55-gallon barrels full of water. They went half a mile away to a place they could get them full. And it took 13 barrels to get it deep enough to baptize somebody there. It actually just came up to my knees. I said, Pastor, is this enough water? He said, if it's not, push them down further. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what I did. And I got to baptize the most people I'd ever done at one time. And that was, there was, I think it was 49 people that I got to baptize that day. But uh, that was from the year before when we spoke about the church until the year we actually had the first service and baptized people there. And those are the people that had joined the church over that time period. And I had an experience there that I never had before. Hope I never have it again unless God wants it to happen. I was in the water, and I don't know if there's a picture there. I'm not, I'm not going to try, but I was standing in the water, and I'd already baptized several people. And as uh, you know, they'd come in, the, the people stood around the rim of the baptistry. And as they were, they were going out, the people, they'd clap and shout and things like that, and then someone else would be coming down in. Well, one lady came to the edge, and she stopped. And the ladies that were at the top, they looked at her and said, go on in, go on in. We don't, we don't want you to back up because she had been having some doubts. Well, all of a sudden, this, this woman went into convulsions. I mean, she was out of it. Demon oppression. Don't do it. It will change you. If you go, and I'm, and I'm not talking about baptismal regeneration, but I'm talking about she was committing to being a new person in Christ. And neither the baptism was sealed that with all the people. Well, that woman, she just fell over right on top of the step up there. These women grabbed her up, and they ran off. I said, well, I wonder what will happen there. Well, someone else took her place. She came down and was baptized. Now it's baptized. And all of a sudden, the, the ladies, Joy, will not you give me a, an African Greece sound right now? I heard that times 25. And I looked up, and here come these ladies that had carried her off. They were carrying her back, arm for arm, foot for foot, somebody under the middle holding her. They said, preacher, catch her. And it was that down there. And they brought her right there, and they just dumped her. I called her. And I, they said, put her under now. I never had anybody tell me to do that. But I did. And the preacher said, uh, the pastor Michael that she saw said, you didn't get her knee, do it again. So I did it again. We brought her back up, and when I did, I set her on the, on the ground in there, and she was in her right mind, praising God. And up those steps, she went, and the whole church just, just lost it. It was just an, an awesome thing. But, you know, we don't realize, because of where we live, moving from the kingdom of darkness when you've been practicing the darkness the way they did, into light. It's a, it's a struggle. And you know who that lady is now? She married a deacon in the church, and she just serves with him going around house by house telling people about Jesus and saying, Jesus can change you. And I just go back and go, wow, praise God for that. And I was waiting for somebody to do this. Uh, this is a, a, just a church meal. You know, you have church meals around here, right? And how many of you don't like church meals? How many of you do like church meals? I thought so. Well, I was preaching at this church, Shady Grove. And I heard some chickens outside. You can see them up there in that corner. Um, and as I was there, all of a sudden I heard, Arr! he lost his head. <laughs> then I, I just kept on preaching or trying I got to thinking about what I'd heard. Did I really hear what I thought I heard? And then all of a sudden, again, and again, and again. They were preparing a fresh lunch for us. And, you know, plucking and all. My wife loves, loves to tell about the plucking of the chickens. Uh, they thought they were going to show her something one time at one of the churches. And, uh, oh, we did that all the time at home. She said, did you do this? And they they'd already had the feet cut off. And said, this is the best part of the chicken. You know what we do with the feet at home? Here, puppy, puppy, puppy. <laughs> like that. That's the best part. And you know who it's the best part to? 
How many of you, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I want you to be truthful now, how many of you ladies are 70 or over? Okay, you get the feet. All right, that's who get the older ladies. Do you know why over there they get them? They don't have any teeth to chew with, and that, when they boil them, they get so tender. And guess what they're wrapped in? They're wrapped in the guts like that. I saw that face. <laughs> but you know what? They don't waste anything about that chicken. Everybody gets something. The little kids, when they're finished, the pastor, I, I watched him the first time I ever watched him eat a chicken leg. <laughs> like that. And he got done, hmm, come here. His grandson, he handed it to him. His grandson took that bone, jabbed it in his mouth, <laughs> cracked, cracked it open, and he chewed that whole leg up. The bone and everything. I thought he was going to just suck the inside of it up. No. He, he got that first, then he just chewed the bone up. Crunch, 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 crunch. What would we say about that here in the U.S.? Oh, he'll get choked on the bone. No, he didn't. He just chewed it up and swallowed it. He knew what to do. But I thought, hmm, I wouldn't ever do that to my kids. But you know what? I got to thinking, just up here, you know, Roger would do that with his kids. I just kidding. I love you, Roger. The man down in the corner in the blue shirt. If I ever had a doubt about God was using the ministry to reach people, he would be the case that it was reaching people. This, he was a young man. His name is Dennis Cap, and Dennis is in Shady Grove Church now, and um, he is a deacon in the church. He's also the transportation director, if you want to call that. He bought an old van to haul people back and forth to work during the week. And you know what he really bought the van for? Is to go pick up people to bring them to church that couldn't. And he, he brings three or four loads of people every time the church meets uh, to the church. And he was saved in one of the schools over there when we held a big rally there. But Dennis, he also married the pastor's daughter. So that might have had something to do with him being at church all the time and being faithful. But he's a great guy. And... Uh, I just, I just love everybody in the church so much. Um, the public school ministry is the biggest part of the ministry, I say. We reach more people through that than anything. Uh, you'll see the man standing here, he's holding up a Bible. He's the principal of the school that you see there. And uh, that's something that's very scarce over there, Bibles. Um, we always get, try to give one Bible, a, a good study Bible, to the principal of the school. As his leadership goes, so goes everything in the school. And if he's got a Bible and he wants to read, and they always treasure the Word of God, they take those Bibles and they teach the kids. We also try to leave uh, uh, eight or ten uh, New Testaments and some whole Bibles in each school. And we usually take a soccer ball. Every kid loves a soccer ball, and they always want that soccer ball. But we try to leave a soccer ball so they'll have something you know, to play with in the other times there. But it's, it's a great ministry, reach many, many people that way. And uh, this uh, person standing at the front with their hands raised like that, uh, I got that uh, close-up picture, or, or someone took that picture at one of the schools. And uh, the reason they've got their hands up like that, after we present the gospel to them, I always ask them just to raise your hands if you receive Christ. And then they have people that are standing around get their names and see who they are, and they follow up with them. But uh, I, it's always a joy to just see them throw their hands up. They're not afraid. You know, you're, you're in a, a sea of, 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 of black people that have white hands just like me. And those palms show up like that, and I go, wow. Praise God for that. And you might have a school of, of two or 3,000 students, and you see that response when you come to that. This is a, uh, a school it's called Magdalene Memorial School. I got a call from the pastor uh, about two months after my mother died. Her name is Magdalene. His wife's name is Magdalene. But uh, he asked me if he could name their school after my mother. Next time you come, bring a picture of your mother so we can hang it in the school. Well, I told him I'd be honored to do that. And my mom, my mom uh, taught the same church for 60 years, all the kids that were the kindergartners. And this school started off with one room of kindergartners. And uh, 
I know that if you could see from heaven down, Mama was smiling when she saw her name up on that. But I, I thought that was just a great honor. Right now, that school has uh, seven grades that are going to have that first eighth grade next year, and they're going on all the way through the, the twelfth grades this school. This is usually a crowd like we see at most of the schools. And I, I tell you, just to preach to that many people one time, it's just an awesome thing. And uh, I, when I, you see the sea of hands like that? Yes, we received. They didn't say we received. We received Christ. They always put that seated on the end of it. But it's, a, it's an awesome thing. Uh, that little boy, center at the bottom, his name, I, I can actually remember his name. You know why? He's got the same name my grandson has. I had, he's, is that little blue Bible visible in his hands there? Yeah. The little blue Gideon Bible. I've got a red one here. Right in there. I was on my way over four or five years ago. My grandson, Sammy, said, Papa, I got this Bible. I want you to give it to somebody. I said, okay, Sammy, I'll do that. I'll find somebody. Well, I got over there, and I said, well, there's going to be, you know, 50,000 kids I'm going to see. How am I going to pick out who to give this to? So at this school, I've, I've been trying to think of a way all week long, or uh, that two-week period, and finally I said, well, why don't I just ask you for somebody called Sammy here? So I did. Well, that's Sammy right there from Zambia. And I gave him that Bible, and when I first gave it to him, he's not quite holding it that way exactly, but he brought it right up on his heart like that and held it and squeezed it. And all the kids around him reached over just to touch that Bible. That was the only Bible in that whole school at that time because we hadn't give, given them the others yet. But they um, treasure the Word of God. If they can get one, they have something that's beyond their thoughts of ever having it. And that's part of the ministry is giving Bibles away. There's a better picture. Uh, we also do some disaster relief when the tornadoes come through. And I heard somebody say this morning that they thought they might have one of those around here. And then I heard somebody say they might have one in Oklahoma. Then, but you know what? I got a call, uh, not a call, a message from my daughter in North Carolina. One went within uh, two miles of my house while I've been up here. And uh, she went over to check the house, make sure everything was okay. But, you know, when, when a tornado goes through, when a flood comes through, the people are just hurting. They don't know what to do. How do I clean up? How do I do this? We go try to help do that. We usually try to get a group of people to go because one person can't do a lot. But, you know, if I took two benches of you guys, right, especially this front two benches, right, y'all got a lot of youth in you and strength, and, and you, you would make a great cook. <laughs> I didn't want to leave that out. But, but still, you know, you won't take, and you, you, it's just an experience to go help people through ministry, I mean, through di a disaster like that. And it's a, they're always so grateful. I always give them a Bible signed by the team that went there. And it, it's just a good thing. Uh, we do a lot of short-term mission trips. We have been, I have been doing those for several years, been to several different countries, but also always in all those countries. It's just the same thing. And down at the, that big picture, that big board going across it, that's me when I was a real man. <laughs> I can't do all that as much as I could, but uh, we were building something that for Roger to live in up at the camp when he was there. And on the right-hand side, oh, uh, uh, is that the truck sitting up there? But anyhow, uh, we, we uh, helped move Roger to the camp back in that time. Uh, and not only Roger, the whole family. But anyhow, uh, that's an octoball game that we built while we were up there. Again, just doing what we can to help people have a place to go to exalt the name of Christ, to edify the church, and to evangelize the lost, and equip believers to be good disciples of Christ. Because what are we supposed to do? What's Matthew chapter 28 tell us to do? That right there. Just remember that, and that's all I've got to say about that. And you could click that off, it'd be fine. And I do urge you, consider what you can do. In the name of Christ. Pick some of these things up as you go out on the table. I'll be out there as soon as I can. I'll tell you stories about those things on the table. 
uh, when you go by. But with that, let's turn to um, Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. While you're turning there, I want to let you know I'm, I'm actually a pastor too. I pastor a church plant. It's called Triple Cross Cowboy Church. We meet once a week on Tuesday nights. Uh, Tuesday nights is a week when people that, uh, for whatever reason, don't feel comfortable uh, going to, quote, regular church like today. Um, so a lot of times they have reasons because they have chicken houses to look at. Most of the people are people that work on Sunday that come to the church. So they come on Tuesday night. Somehow, no, Tuesday night works, or Thursday. But Tuesday works for Triple Cross. And we've got a group of about uh, 40 to 45 people that come some every week, some part of the weeks, just when they can. But uh, it's, it's another way of helping people to grow in Christ. And we, we don't call them members at the church there. We call them partners. Cowboy church, partner. You know, and I like that pretty good because you know, what, what do people in church do? They partner with one another to do something. And that's what we're all about. And that's why I came here today to share the gospel. Maybe God will touch your heart to partner with Psalm 121 Ministries. Again, this is the church here. We are the church there. We're doing work there, but we all partner together. And guess what? We can do more that way because the whole body of Christ works together. We, we can reach many, many people. But in Galatians chapter 6, I want us to think about something. What are you sowing this time of the year, uh, especially back home? It's, you're, you're just a little further behind in planting things here. It's just because the season's a little colder. It had not quite opened up yet. But at my house right now, I've got tomato plants about this tall. They've been in the ground and long enough, and they've got little tomatoes about that big on them. How many of you like tomatoes, homegrown tomatoes? Oh, nothing better than having a homegrown tomato about that big. Red all the way through, all of the green parts that are inside of it, no hard parts, you know, just juicy, just mm. Wouldn't you love to have one right now with a great big old piece of bread, mayo, <laughs> slattering off the sides, salt and pepper, tomato about that thick on it, another piece on top. And what would it do when you did this? You go, but man, then you get to mop that up out of your plate. That's good. It's great. But you know what? You can't get a tomato like that unless you first plant it. You won't find that at the store. It's rare to find anything that's even close to that at a store. You've got to plant the seed so that you can get the plant, so that you can dig around it, so that you can fertilize around it, so that you can get it tied up good so it has those great, big, pretty tomatoes on it. And man, that is really awesome if you like that. And I really do. It, I, this is probably a stretch. How many of you like, I'm going to say this very gently, Krispy Kreme donuts? Ah, we have some people up here that like them too. I'll tell you what. There's nothing like a Krispy Kreme donut. I know Roger, he likes those old Dunkin' Donuts and stuff like that. That's the reason I said it that way. But, but Krispy Kreme donuts, hey, listen, you can reach in a box, and it's hot. You pull it out, and you pinch it like that, and you just go, mm, all the way down. That's what manna tasted like in the wilderness. I, that's what that was like. But, you know, you don't get those things unless you go for it. You've got to buy it, you've got to plant it, you've got to dig around it. But this passage says this, let him that is taught in the word, who in this building is taught in the word? All of you. Roger's your pastor, he te teaches you, he does that. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teaches all good things. You know what that verse tells you, tells, you, tells me? You take care of your pastor. You take care of him, and, and, and I know you do that here. You take care of the pastor because that's what he's teaching you. He's growing you. I, I hope you feel in your heart 
that for the time Roger's been here, I know it took a little while to get used to him. But, but, but since he's got here, you've got used to him, and you say, you know, he's worth the money. You know, let's pay him. Let, let's do that. And if you hadn't started doing that, start doing it, okay? But, but anyhow, uh, just, just give him your all. Follow him. Follow his vision. But let him that is tall in the word communicate unto him that teaches in all good things. Be not deceived. It goes with that verse I just said. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, can you finish it? That shall he also reap. You know, I was talking about the tomatoes. If you don't sow it, you're not going to reap a tomato. If you don't go to Krispy Kreme and buy the donuts, you're not going to reap the donut. If you don't take care of your preacher, you're not going to grow like you could in Christ because you are to take care of him. You will not reap those blessings unless you take care of your pastor. For he that sows to his flesh, I guess you could call buying the donuts sowing to the flesh a little bit. If he eat a lot of them, it'll be a lot of it. <laughs> I saw you mimic your a lot of it right there. That was neat. But, but you know, we're not to sow to things just of this earth. We're to sow in heavenly things. My wife and I were at her dad's house a while back. And uh, her sister and her brother had come and visited that day. I said, we were there. She was there. She came home. She was so proud of what her daddy told her. And she told me what it was. But they came in talking about stuff that they had done, things they were going to do, things that they had spent their money on, this, that, and the other. And then they kind of made fun of my wife. Says, you don't ever get to do things like that. And Joyce, that's okay. Well, here's what happened. After they left, Joy was still there, my wife. And she said, um, he said, Joy, they don't get it. You and Paul sow for eternity. They sow for now. They sow to the flesh. And that's, a, that's the best example I can think of for that. They, 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 they had the campers. They had the, the tractors, the boats, and all that stuff. And y'all don't have anything. Oh, yes, we do. We have four kids that are serving the Lord, and their kids are serving the Lord. And I don't tell you what, that's worth more than all the boats and yachts and whatever it is the devil wants to offer me. But, but he understood what was happening. That was a spiritual warfare. He that sows to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. There's no eternal reward for what you buy here, for what you spend on yourself. That comes from what you do for others. And I noticed the mission board out there, and I was talking with Roger and hearing somebody else talking about this one going to Guyana and this one doing this. You know, that's eternal reward. The other, not so much any good as far as eternity goes like that. He that sows to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. It means it's just going to die and go away. But he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. There's an eternity out there, eternal rewards for what you invest in the work of God. Let us not grow weary. If you've been a giver your whole life, and you say, I just don't know if it's going to do anything, just keep doing it. Don't grow weary in well-doing, doing the right thing. For in due season, we shall reap. I think about this. What do you spend all that time in Africa for? I'm sowing a crop. You know, when you sow things, you sow different ways. That tomato plant, you pretty much have to sow them a seed in one place, a seed in one place, and cover it up and water it, pat the dirt down a little bit, and it'll pop up, pop up, pop up. You know, one at a time sowing is time consuming. You do get your hands dirty. If you get, get, get to work in the ministry, your hands are going to get dirty. And you, it may be dirty from dirt. Maybe dirty from having to work with somebody that's living in sin and you're trying to, Lord, help us figure out a way to get out of that. It, it, a lot of ways you get your hands dirty. But there's other ways to sow also other than one seed at a time. Sometimes we, we have these uh, broadcast seeders you, you do your yard with. 
you just got a strap around your neck, you dump grass seed in like that, and you walk across the yard just cranking that thing, throwing seed out all over everything. And, you know, and you're sowing a lot of seed out there when you put it on a yard like that. Well, that's another way to sow. Or if you're a farmer, you have a drill, huge drills now. We used to have one that had seven spouts that came down off of it when I was a boy. And we thought we were big time back then, and it wouldn't sow a space that long. So when wheat or something like that, it had seven spouts, and it had seven little rows of wheat across there. But they have them now, they're, they're wide as this church, and even wider. And they got tractors about three times that day. <laughs> and I have yet to ride on one of those tractors. I'm going to do it someday. But, but you know, uh, there are many ways to sow. But here's one thing, certain. You can drive across the field with that big tractor and that, that uh, big uh, cedar that goes all the way across this church. If you don't put any seed on it, all you're doing is spinning your wheels. You're not going to get anything out of it, except a crop of weeds. Who wants a crop of weeds? I want something that's going to produce fruit. I like those tomatoes. <laughs> mm, those are great. I like Bobby James that came to Christ just before he entered first grade. Got a taste of what that was like. I got to lead Bobby to the Lord. And you see him out now. He is a Christian doing it right. You lead people to Christ, you don't go wrong. God picks up where you left off because the Holy Spirit comes right in here. And he's with them until they leave this earth and arrive in heaven. Sealed by the Spirit until the day of redemption. You don't waste your time when you sow the good seed of the word. In Zambia, I'm not wasting my time. Uh, going from place to place telling people about the work in Zambia. I'm not wasting my time. Going to a church and trying to raise funds for uh, the, the local ministry of going somewhere to, to take a trailer load of water and food and clothing to a place that's been wiped out. That's not wasting time. That's sowing for eternity. And, and that is a wonderful thing. Since the inception of Psalm 121 Ministries, there have been something over 5 million people have heard the gospel. Now, of that 5 million people, I wish I could tell you how many people have trusted Christ, but I can't. Because I'm going to tell you this. If someone came and told me they trusted Christ today, I would take them at their word. I don't know that. But I do know they'll hear the gospel. I do know that they heard that. And I do know that the Holy Spirit can take that word and change their life. These crowds that we saw at these schools, probably half of every school we go into says we receive Christ. I take that as it is. The only thing I really know for sure is how many students were there and how many of them heard the gospel. And that's why I keep doing it over and over and over. Whether I'm there physically or whether we're helping Pastor Skilyanga do that with the pastors that he works with. The pastors, most of the pastors over there, uh, if they have a full-time job, maybe $100, 200 at the most for a month. And it's barely eking out an existence. They want to go to the schools to preach. But they can't. They've got to work to get that so they can feed their families. Their families, most of the families of the, the uh, indigenous people over there, they're like Rogers. They have a whole two or three benches full. <laughs> you know, they've got a lot, of, a lot of kids. And that takes a lot to feed them. And then, let me just tell your boys, I can't tell Maya, she's not, and your daughters and all. In Africa, Ethan, you never make money for yourself. It always goes to him. Ho-ho, oh, killer, isn't it? Justin, hey, Byron, you might go somewhere else. And even if you live way out, oh, I better not leave Cameron out. But, but you know what? Even if you go somewhere else, you send the money home to Papa. Then he says, okay, we've got this much. Now I'm going to send this much back to each boy because he's got a wife and three kids. He's got a wife and five kids. Oh, he's single. 
I'm going to give him just a little bit, just enough. <laughs> Pastor Michael, he's got a sense of humor. His son loves carrots. That, that boy, you know those bags of carrots about this big, you can get like two or three pounds in them, you know? If I want to make Sam happy, I go buy a market over there and get a big bunch of carrots. And while I'm preaching, he's sitting back there like Bugs Bunny. <laughs> Putting those things away. But it's, it's not very expensive to take care of Sam. He's by himself, or was until just recently. But, but the, the papa does that. Now, I'm not telling you to start a new thing, but that's the way they do it over there. And I learned that very soon in the ministry over there. But, but that's the way they meet the money out. But see, the thing about it is uh, they do their culture. We do our culture. I'm not imposing American culture on them. All I'm telling them about is the Bible culture. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you can be saved. You know, that's the same everywhere you go. It never changes. Trust him. Don't trust in the preacher and his American ways. Don't trust in this preacher and his African ways. Don't trust in the, you know, you just put anything there. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what matters. You know, whether you're a Catholic, a Baptist, a Bible church, a Methodist church, all those are tags that are not mentioned in here. This says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If we preach Jesus, we've done it. All the other stuff, and I don't like to say it, but it's what it is. They, they, there are movements down through history where the Bible has been misrepresented and so a group pulls out of that and goes to another place. And then it does it again and it goes, a different name comes up. But the real reason is it varies, goes away from the book. And that's the way a lot of the different places have been started. Whichever one you are, preach the book. Don't preach politics. Don't preach a politician. Don't preach a certain group but preach the word of God and let it go right down inside your soul. You can walk up into heaven one day if you've trusted Christ. There's not a Baptist gate or a Bible church gate or a Methodist gate. It's all one gate. The way, the gate is Jesus Christ. No man comes to the Father but by him. Always keep that central. When we go to Africa, when we go to other countries, when we go anywhere, and be on the plane going. You want to find out how many Christians are on the plane. You only have to say one thing. Hallelujah! And you'll get a call back. Somewhere on that plane, you'll hear it again. You turn around and look and see where it came from. You've got somebody you can talk to going over on to wherever you're going. Before you know it, there's another one joined the group, and another one joined the group. I'm glad you said that. They all know what it means to praise Jehovah. And I hope you know what that means, too. You know Jesus Christ, because he is the way, the truth, and the life. Let's bow our heads. I'm going to let Roger give whatever invitation he wants to and uh, instructions after that, but I want to just pray with you all. And I want you to think about it. Now, am I sowing the right thing? Am I looking to eternity? Or am I looking at it now? My greatest desire in my heart that you become an eternal sower that sows in eternity. Some of you are doing it and doing a great job of it, I know. Some of you have done it part of the time. But we know we need to be that way all the time. And you know what? God gives you joy in living, just living for him and doing that. That's even better than keeping it and spending it on yourself. Because you see the eternal value in what's laying out there. Father, I pray that these folks today, they've been good listeners. Uh, I just pray that you have spoken to their hearts and helped them to be different today. 
because they've had a meeting with you in a different way than maybe they have before. Or, or they have had a restirring of something inside of them. Lord, we know sometimes we, we get in a rut as your, as your children. Lord, I do that sometimes, and I have to have a stirring. And Lord, I just pray that that's happened to us today in so many ways. May we leave this place better than we came in. May some that don't know you uh, confess Christ, Lord, in their, in their lives. And Lord, I just pray whatever invitation and close that happens, Lord, it brings honor and glory to you. And ask us in Jesus' name.